So I'll look, uh, the intro will be Christina. Thanks for joining um, uh, myself, obviously Jeremy uh, and Mark. Christina uh, will take the lead and then hand over to me. Over to you, Christina. All right, lovely. Well, um, just as just to remind everyone that this session is being recorded uh, as a few people couldn't attend in person today. But hello for those who have. Uh, and and welcome to what I hope is going to be a really interesting session. I can see there's still somebody waiting in the lobby, so hopefully um, people are are being let in. Um, the, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christina Blacklaws. I'm former president of the Law Society of England and Wales, and I currently chair two UK government bodies in the law and technology space. And of course, I'm really proud and excited uh, to be head of faculty, um, as um, Mr. Beer puts it, Dean, which I rather like, um, or for the Legal Technology and Innovation Institute, and to be involved in what is an amazing global programme. Uh, we have indeed a, a fantastic and outstanding faculty and set of partners, and you're going to hear from some of them today. And they're experts in their fields, practitioners, academia, uh, government, technologists um, from all the leading jurisdictions. So we really have the dream team for you. Um, and just on a personal um, reflection, the reason why I'm involved with Lytic uh, is because it really delivers something that is new and I would say absolutely necessary. Instead of focusing on the academic and the thought leadership side of legal tech, we concentrate on the things that are most important to legal practitioners and those who are working either in firms or legal departments. Uh, and the course is really designed to deliver practical skills, practical knowledge, practical experience across the most relevant technologies and innovations for law. And, and the course gives everybody, I hope, a breadth of understanding and engagement which enables them to be confident, uh, and I'll talk about confidence a bit later maybe, to apply this newfound knowledge directly into their law firm. Um, but hey guys, you don't need to take my word for it because you'll hear in a little bit from some actual real life participants in cohort one. Um, and through the course, we, we try to equip participants with new skills uh, to benefit not just them and their careers, but their law firms and their departments, of course, their clients. Um, participants get to understand all the relevant technologies and more importantly, to develop that deep knowledge of the applications and how this is relevant to their business by gaining that hands on experience across a whole range of use cases. Um, so we, we cover new delivery models and assess the developing competitive environment. It's, it's trying to future proof the participants and their businesses. And we have a fantastic team of partners from big tech like the likes of Microsoft um, to Thomson Reuters and some brilliant and forward thinking institutions like Middlesex University, uh, University of New South Wales, are uh, all actually delivering courses for us. Um, and uh, we mustn't forget the startup and scale up community who are supporting us with some great creativity and entrepreneurship. Um, as I said, Lytics very heavily focused on ensuring that participants gain that, that real life hands on experience of using the relevant technologies in a business context. So examples of which you get to use AI technology, understand the nuances of machine learning and NLP in real life legal use cases. Um, so through the course, participants get to build a chatbot from a very basic model through to an advanced client engagement onboarding use case. 
Uh, and all of this taught by some of the world's leading practitioners. And what we're trying to do, I think, here is to create a legacy and create a community. Uh, and this is one of, I think, my, one of the most exciting aims of Lytic is that we want to have that global ecosystem. And whether you're a participant, current, present, um, future, uh, you will have access to peers across the globe. I think in our first, in our cohort one, we have participants from 16 different jurisdictions. Um, and we've been, in addition to the course, we run uh, a lot of networking. We run uh, regular book clubs where we, uh, in a very informal way, engage with our um, uh, cohort and, you know, really cover the things that they want to to delve into a bit more uh, about. So uh, I hope you can tell I'm really excited about being involved in this and I hope that over the next um, oh, 45 minutes or so uh, you might think there's something in it for you or your team or your business. So um, with that I will um, be quiet uh, and move over to Shaq who's going to say not going to repeat what I said because yeah, we decided look, that we I'll weren't going to do now. this at the outset I thought, but he's I going thought. to say um, a few words of introduction. I thought you'd leave the 16 countries part for me but yeah, no, it's, it's the best bit yeah. Shaq I, I, I had to have <laughs> that sorry. <laughs> oh, look, so, so thanks for joining everyone and I think you know just echoing what um, Christina said you know it's we're in the middle of uh, the pilot cohort and so far it's been you know a resounding success I mean I've you know joined most of the sessions and you know we've we had a session today which was on um, legal smart contracts and as much as we tried to avoid the um, the coding element you know it was key for um, participants to understand some of the nuances around what we're doing around legal smart contracts and this was with one of our um, tech partners, and that's Jure, and 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 you know, Mark knows them, Christina knows them quite well, and onwards and upwards, you know, for the journey, you know, we've got legal operations, um, law tech strategy that Christina and and Rob are delivering at the moment, um, and I'm sure Jane um, was joining us from South Africa, and Miklos from Hungary, so they're participants in the pilot cohort, and 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 they'll give you their views. Um, before we get to them, I want to bring in um, the the rest of the the kind of panel. So Mark, um, obviously a good friend and a key part of the faculty, and someone who's had significant input in the program overall, and also Jeremy, um, a key partner in helping publish and market this um, from a Jameson legal perspective globally. Um, so Mark, um, over to you then. I suppose one of the the, the points is on on this. You know, when we started off, you know, the discussion was, you know, how do we help the, the, the legal industry and, and especially on relevant technology skills and law firms specifically? Um, so what's, you know, your view in terms of where we are today on focused technology training for legal professionals and, uh, and, and has it, you know, pivoted over the last 12, 18 months or due to the pandemic or increased in terms of pace, the, the, the desperate need for, for more of this training. Well, thanks very much, Shaq, and uh, and hello, everyone. The, <laughs> it's it's a, it's an interesting story because for much of the profession, uh, COVID has yeah. not been good to them. Um, I think it's it's a situation that I, I I know well because when you talk to a lawyer or a law firm and you say how are you, they say we're incredibly busy, but everybody else is quiet. Um, now, if you have 10 conversations with 10 lawyers in 10 different firms and they all tell you the same thing, it normally indicates that the market is quite flat, although no lawyer ever admits that they're not busy. Um, whether they're effective is a different story. So for those firms that have struggled during the pandemic, um, one obvious place to cut is on training. And I think we're starting to see um, elements of budget cutting in, in in many firms. Now, other firms, I think, are are also looking at training, but but even if they're doing well, they're looking at what they can bring in house. So, to some extent, 
what I think is happening is that as much as possible, firms are either doing away with what they might call the maintenance training, or they're bringing in-house or continuing to bring in-house maintenance training uh, updates on contract, which they get free from barristers chambers and, and the like. But what's consistent, Shaq, what is consistent, whichever law firm I talk to, is a realization that the one piece of training that is critical is about legal technology and its implications on firms and its implications on legal systems. And the other thing that's consistent is that law firms know that they can't teach it in-house. Now, that's not all law firms, you know, look at some fantastic law firms that are really far ahead on legal technology. But even there, their focus tends to be on technology that makes them more profitable, not technology that improves the uh, community at large. So so even there, there's a realization that legal technology training is is absolutely critical. So for the firms that are cutting back, they will focus on the training that's most important to them. For firms that are continuing to deliver, they'll teach in-house what they consider consistent, uh, but they will outsource what they can't do. So for both types of firms, I think legal technology training is ever more critical. And when you talk to the junior members of the firm, it's the one thing that they love. It's the exciting thing, particularly where you combine technology with practical uh, examples of how they can utilize it. And you add on to that the fact that they can help their community and improve access to justice whilst doing it. it it's an absolutely perfect combination for junior lawyers and at the top end of the practice, a realization that the firm has to look into this. So I think for law firms, really positive. For general counsel, the consistent message is um, we know that we ought to have more technology, but we just don't have the time to work out which technology. So what they're looking for is the ability to send colleagues from the team out to um, training sessions where they can engage with technology, engage with practitioners, engage with those that are developing the technology and report back and say, hey, I've used some really good technology. I actually tried it out. I think it's going to be great for us, whether it's in document review, whether it is in drafting contracts, whatever it might be. And then for the law to, law firm to, to sorry, the, the, the business, the general counsel to move forward and adopt that technology. So in summary, I think whatever element of the profession a lawyer is in, uh, junior or senior, in-house or private practice, doing well, uh, could do better. Everybody at the moment is looking towards legal technology, the practical implications of it, how best to use it and how best to learn about it. So I think it's the perfect time. Excellent, thank you for that. And and just for the audience, look, you can feel free to raise a hand at any point if you want to kind of ask a specific question, uh, but we will obviously give you the best part of half an hour to kind of um, Q&A uh, with, with, with the panel and, and obviously some of the current students. Um, thanks, Mark. And then just just on, on, on with that, and it's a good point because some of the participants that we're talking to at the moment are you know, from large corporates or, or big law, and, and they are representing a view of evaluating legal technology, looking at what they can do for their legal department and what's out there. So looking at valid use cases and success stories. So a level of due diligence has taken place. Um, and then they go back and, and see how that can fit into their kind of culture and, and, and operating model. So it's, it's a, uh, some really good, good points. Um, just on that, then I'll reach or pass on to Jeremy Small from Jameson Legal, um, obviously a leader in, in, in legal recruitment. Um, so it's an interesting view in terms of what's happening out there in terms of our employers looking for the, the T-shaped lawyer, they're looking for more tech skills. Um, over to you, Jeremy, for, for your views. Great. Thanks, Shaq. And it, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I would say looking at it from a recruitment perspective, it's still only a small but growing minority of law firms that are clearly leaning towards the T-shaped lawyer. Um, by that, I mean it tends to be the largest law firms uh, that have uh, more of a, an understanding of the, the sector and the space and the need for lawyers to be uh, tech trained. Um, uh, I would also say that, in fact, in-house lawyers tend to, in many organisations, uh, be more viewed as T-shaped lawyers than perhaps law firms are. 
Um, at most firms, there still seems to be a real division between those that are responsible for legal technology and innovation um, and the larger group of practicing lawyers. So there's almost a feeling of an us and them and that, uh, you know, uh, lawyers are not uh, all to be trained uh, in technology, uh, but there can be a small group within a law firm that is responsible for that. And I think that needs to change and will change over time. Um, I think many firms are recognising that legal technology is, is revolutionising certain legal practices and they're beginning to establish uh, teams that are capable to assess and implement and develop legal technology, um, both uh, internally and also for their clients. Uh, and they're recognising increasingly that's what their clients want. So there's certainly some drivers there. Um, there is some investment in training lawyers at an early stage in terms of technology, whether that's uh, through the colleges of law or the, the within the training contract or through external training like the LTIC. Uh, but and some firms have set up legal technology seats, um, but they tend to be the minority. Uh, so they'll pick one or two individuals to train up, whereas it it hasn't become something where everyone is getting trained. Um, so that certainly also needs to needs to change uh, in some way. Um, I personally believe that there's a movement towards T-shaped lawyers and um, that will change from a trickle to a flood um, as we see more um, uh, legal technology uh, software entities making a splash in the market, changing processes, changing how lawyers work. I think there will be a real recognition over the next few years that um, it's it's necessary to do that. And there'll be a drive towards hiring people that have an understanding of legal technology and um, have that sort of T-shape to them. Um, uh, lawyers going forwards that do uh, that are T-shaped lawyers are definitely seeing more opportunities not just opportunities with within law firms, but opportunities in house, opportunities with legal tech companies. Um, you've you've probably seen this year that a lot of legal tech companies are now getting, you know, big funding. It's catching up with um, fintech, and there's hundreds of millions of investments, if not billions, of investments coming in each year, and that means that these entities are becoming. Um, uh, more well known, more important, having more of an effect on the industry. And so there will be more and more opportunities for lawyers to actually work within those uh, entities, as well as the traditional roots of, of law firms and, and in-house teams. Uh, so it's exciting times. Haven't, we haven't got there yet, but I think there's it's definitely a movement towards T-shaped lawyers, but it's still a little bit of a trickle rather than a flood. Excellent, thanks. And, and are you seeing more of the kind of new roles, the legal engineers, legal project managers, the innovation teams. I mean, one of the, the observations I've had over the last couple of years, a um, number of startups that I work with, you know, where they've landed sort of a decent enough contract with a law firm to go in and implement technology. They're all excited, but six, nine months later, you know, it's it's not moved forward. It's stalled because change management 101 or you know, the connectivity between, you know, internal teams has not got the right backing internally. And those that have actually been successful have, you know, pointed out that one key factor is an in-house innovation team has helped be that glue internally to bring the right stakeholders to the table and connect the right people and and and, and give rise to kind of, so it, it, it does resonate that new roles are needed even within law firms. And and how are you seeing that? Are you seeing that number kind of ramp up globally or specific jurisdictions? It, it's definitely ramping up. Um, it, again, I would say it's not a flood, but there's a strong growth pattern um, within law firms, uh, but also in other entities like the big four, um, legal tech consultancies, uh, legal tech companies. So there are more roles being created um, and therefore there are more opportunities. Um, we did a quick um, search um, yesterday of the top 100 UK law firms <clears throat> across those sort of main categories of legal engineer, legal technologists, project managers, etc. And there were 32 roles live, um, you know, amongst that top 100. So obviously, those are only the publicly available roles. There will be others. But that's a, you know, there's a reasonable number of, of a, a active roles um, amongst the top 100 um, law firms, and that will continue to grow. Um, there's obviously some key players that have larger teams, um, the likes of A&O, Pinsent Masons, Adolf Shores, etc. 
And I think it'll be mid-sized law firms that will struggle to have the budget or the capability to have these teams. Um, and so going forward, I think um, management of law firms will um, be trying to um, at least get a better understanding of legal technology and uh, move towards perhaps having consultancies or platforms where they can connect to without having to develop their own uh, software um, internally um, or be part of a wider network of collaborating firms um, or um, probably go for legal technology which is um, perhaps in a more easy form like the no code uh, technologies that are out there um, but you can see the growth I mean in terms of one major legal tech uh, consultancy which is psych which you're probably aware of they've grown from 30 or 40 people three years ago to 140 today they're looking to um, uh, treble in the next three to four years so there's huge demand from their clients for their skill set um, and that's a good sign and i think there will be more and more entities um, coming into this space and more and more opportunities particularly big four uh, challenging them but there will be many others um, and it's also interesting that we're seeing roles springing up around the world as well. So, you know, the UK, Germany, Singapore, uh, the US are growth growth areas, but, you know, there's, there's opportunities in many other places as well. Um, and I just think that the volume of money coming into the legal tech space, as I mentioned before, um, with the, the billions being pumped in, uh, that leads to hiring uh, and it also leads to better roles, better salaries, better benefits, and that makes it more attractive. So I think that there will be a movement towards these roles, partly because of that as well. Excellent, thank you. OK, um, back to the governor, the, 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 the dean. Um, Christina, what, what do you see as the, um, you know, we've, we've seen plenty of reports over the last couple of years where the rate of adoption of technology in the legal industry is, is, is not as where it should be and, and that's due to lack of awareness and training. Have you seen um, adoption increase over the pandemic period? I mean, and, and I mean, you know, I see taking a meeting online, I see it as renovation as opposed to innovation, right? You know, it, so, you know, have we seen innovation increase over the last 12 months? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question because we all think we are you know, incredibly disruptive because we're using Zoom and Teams, uh, but actually we're just using the exact same processes with, with a different delivery mechanism. So so I think things have gone backwards and forwards in a sense, if I, if I might be slightly contrary. So, so forwards in that I, I think a, a lot of those who were very, against any use of technology uh, have now experienced how positive that can be for them as individuals and for their business uh, and that you know flexible and agile working remote working as it is at the moment uh, has actually led to an increase in productivity um, ra rather than a decrease. So you know, those who were sceptical about it, I think, have now uh, learned that they can trust their staff to continue to work, even though they aren't under physically under their noses. Uh, so so that, that I think is really positive. And I, as an aside, I think that's really positive for diversity and inclusion as well. Um, but I think we've gone a bit backwards in terms of the commitment to the more transformative, i.e. The, the, the technology that is going to perhaps cost in terms of capital investment uh, and, and a lot of businesses have been holding back on, on that during, um, during this COVID period. Uh, having said that, there was a recent piece of research which showed that uh, digital transformation has been sped up by COVID by over five years. Um, so, so, you know, the, I would say that the time now is ripe and right for uh, businesses to really consider that, that, that next level of investment. But, uh, of course, as, as, as has been said by, by Mark and Jeremy, you, you, you know, it's rarely the tech 
or having the tech which is the problem um it's the lack of utilization of that technology, the lack of adoption within business. And um, again, there's some really good research both by, by Oxford uh, University and the Law Society pre-COVID, but I think that's still, a, that's probably the most relevant period for, for, for us now. And, and that research identified some significant barriers to adoption and, and some of those were structural so that's in in law firms the partnership model the the billable hour model um, these things mitigate against uh, technological change and, and significant change of delivery service models um, but other parts were cultural uh, and and you know colleagues have already referenced um, the the issue around the sort of lack of change management um, processes and, and indeed capability within uh, lots of law firms. But also uh, the things that the research identified was a, a great deal of market confusion, in particular around the, the, the decision makers who um, really struggled to understand what was noise and what was actually relevant to to their to their business uh, and this was this is UK research this is particularly profound in as Jeremy's already identified this in mid-market um, and uh, regional law firms in 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 the UK so lack of a awareness and lack of understanding obviously led to a lack of confidence in terms of actually investing in in technology uh, and and final point on this what the research found was that there was um, a real focus on the iterative technologies, the technologies that were sort of um, back office uh, cost saving as opposed to anything that was uh, client facing and perhaps more transformative in, in nature. So I, I, I would say that I think that the industry is is ripe now for the next phase and that on balance, uh, the terrible thing that has been COVID has uh, an upside, if you like, has been that, that we are now much better placed to not only look at um, what technologies are out there, but actually start to adopt them, successfully implement and embed them into, uh, into our businesses. Excellent. Thanks, Christina. And um, Mark, your thoughts on, on, on that in terms of but I, I think look, I think it's absolutely right, and and the I think the drive is going to come from two places: the drive towards uh, a more efficient uh, legal ecosystem. And do bear in mind that eighty four percent of people with a serious legal issue do not even go and see a lawyer. Okay, eighty four percent of people with a serious legal issue kept awake at night with the pain of a legal issue don't go and see a lawyer. Imagine if it was the healthcare and we said, well, 84% of people kept awake at night with pain, physical pain, choose not to see a doctor because doctors are expensive and they complicate things and it's just easier if I take my own remedy. We'd say it was a failing system, right? So that's the system that, that we're in. But I, I think uh, when it comes to an organisational change, there's absolutely no incentive for a law firm to adjust its model. It profits from inefficiency and that's fine. The market has allowed it. The regulator has given lawyers a monopoly on the provision of legal advice in many jurisdictions and monopolies lead to uh, behaviours which are not client centric. And that's what we're seeing. But there's no reason whilst the lawyers have a monopoly to adjust that behaviour. But what's actually happening, and, and, and many would say, many, many who, who have a view towards a market economics, what's actually happening is that the in-house lawyers, rather than just being slaves to the system that they grew up in, because many of them came from big law, are now saying, well, hang on a second, if I need a risk assessment across 20 markets, the old fashioned way was to go to a global law firm ask them to do a risk assessment on FCPA compliance across 20 markets or, you know, an assessment of whether regulations have changed that might affect the business across 20 markets, pay £10,000 a market to get an Excel spreadsheet, 
have a few conference calls to answer any questions, uh, pay the bill and, and present to the board. Um, the reality is that that's an extremely expensive way of getting real time data which technology can provide. And I think as general counsel and in house lawyers are getting much savvier and they're dictating to the law firms what they will and won't pay for. And when I was general counsel for Mastercard South Asia, Middle East uh, and Africa region, we did away with hourly rates. We paid on value. So we negotiated value at the beginning of an engagement and sometimes the law firm was ahead and sometimes it wasn't, but overall they were ahead. Um, and, and when clients start being innovative about the relationship with the law firm, I think that's where law firms will start to adopt technology. And a good example of that is one of the major London firms was at a conference in Oxford telling everybody what a wonderful job they had done in introducing technology to do document review. So afterwards I went and I said, well, look, it's extraordinary because you must make millions, tens of millions a year by throwing teams at people at document review. Why on earth would the partners vote to adopt a technology that does away with the fee income? Rye smile because their biggest client, a global bank, had said, by the way, we're not paying for document review anymore. So it's the client that will lead to a change, I think, in the behavior of many law firms. And if you look at that renowned website, www.willarobottakemyjob.com, um, it's very clear that 40% chance that judges will be overtaken by robots but only a 4% chance that lawyers will have their jobs taken off them by robots. So I think it's clear, as I say, you know, one has to put one's faith in that website, but it's clear that lawyers are not going to be replaced by robots or AI. But what I think will happen over the next decade is Thank lawyers you. that use AI. It's a great pleasure as well. Thank you. Yeah, okay, take care now. Mm. See you, bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. I think that lawyers who um, use AI will overtake lawyers that don't, and I think that's the direction of travel. So law firms and lawyers getting engaged in the process now are likely to be much more successful in the medium term than lawyers that don't. Thanks, Mark. And an interesting one. I'm speaking to a large international law firm recently about getting involved in one of the legal technology events. And my challenge to them was, well, what's this? Have you got a client story? What have you actually done in terms of innovation and disruptive technology? And um, DocuSign is 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 what they would come forward with. <laughs> and and and. It's funny, it's been a week of these kind of stories. There was another one where there's a thousand slide PowerPoint kind of code of conduct policy within um, a law firm, and they only recently brought in an external consultant who advised them to add a hyperlink to certain sections of this PowerPoint. And that was an amazing, you know, change in, in process for, for, for them. So, you know, it doesn't always have to be disruptive technology. But sometimes the simpler change can make you know a ton of difference. Um, you know, so conscious of time, let me bring in some of the current um, cohorts. So Jane, um, over to you just to share your experience. Um, and don't worry, I won't fail you if there's anything negative. Just be yourself and, and tell us how you're doing. Sure, well, that's a relief. I was uh, I was stressing that this was going to impact my <laughs> success in the course. Um, so yeah, um, I'm Jane. I'm an attorney based in South Africa, and um, it's interesting hearing everyone speak about the nature of big law and and moving into tech. So I started my career in a big law firm. Um, I was working as a banking and finance attorney um, with <laughs> many many documents with many many pages. And um, I'm transitioned out of that space um, into quite a drastically different space. Um, and it, I would now work as the, the internal counsel for a tech startup company. I'm um, part of a team of 10 people and I am their, <laughs> I am their legal team. Um, but through the process, I, I really became aware of um, the nature of technology and how it can be used to really improve our lives and improve business. Um, so a lot of our clients are cryptocurrency based clients um, and so I was alerted to blockchain and the benefits of smart contracts and 
um, through my research, came across the LITIC program. And so far, it, it has been exactly what um, Christina and Shaka have, have said. Um, they're not lying. Um, it really has bridged, for me at least, bridged the gap between everything I was reading about in theory um, and actually giving practical um, advice or practical experience and how that, that can actually work. Um, and so it's been really insightful. It has been very jam-packed. Um, there is a lot of content. And um, I think, yeah, it definitely has been super beneficial for me. Um, I think my favorite courses so far have probably been the more recent ones around legal design thinking and contract innovation. Um, being a from a commercial background, these are areas that I can't wait to kind of delve in more and um, even in a, from a tech startup perspective, um, I've been able to implement a lot of what I've learned already just from a, a point of view of moving from sale to, uh, you know, from initial negotiations to sign client um, is, has been a lot smoother by implementing, um, you know, contract innovation, simplifying our, our, our sales agreements. So it really has been a beneficial course. Um, and it really has been a privilege to be a part of the, the first cohort. Um, I think there's definitely, like with anything that's a first, there's always room for improvement. Um, and I think credit to, to Shaq and Christina for being open to our criticisms and our um, suggestions for going forward. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for, for this, this area of law. I mean, um, in South Africa, there's, there's a lot of scope for it, um, particularly in um, promoting access to justice and um, simplifying legal legal procedures to enable more people to have their voice heard, to access simple things like writing a will. Um, so there is really a lot of scope. And I think as yeah, things progress, courses like Litic are going to become a lot more popular um, within the legal fraternity. Um, so yeah. Thanks, Shane. Thanks for that. Um, and on that, we'll jump over to Dubai and Varsha. Thanks, Shaq. Uh, thank you, everyone, and hello, everyone. Um, afternoon, evening, wherever we are. And um, I would say um, I wouldn't repeat what everyone has said, what Christina, Mark, Jeremy, Shaq, and Jane has said. Um, what I would say is uh, definitely um, I got to know about this course. I was speaking to Shaq and a couple of other colleagues, and it's really a course of one of its kind. Um, I work in house. Um, I'm a senior solicitor in a tech company. And I would say from a from a lawyer's perspective, this course has really helped me from very small basics in terms of really understanding, you know, sometimes it's not about even going and buying tech. You know, often in house we think we can you, we see lots of fancy tech that we spoke about, which one to choose in, but to, to be able to see which one to choose and how to choose, you need to have some basic understanding in terms of your processes. What is it that, you know, you have to look back and look inside to what you're looking for. And this course has been been really, really helpful in in a lot many ways. I've been able to already implement a lot of good stuff in terms of what could be the legal tech essentials, uh, in terms of chatbot, legal design thinking, contract automation. Uh, one good thing that I really liked about the course is that it's really the scope and the breadth is very wide. Um, in terms of it really goes from very basic elementary stuff in terms of, you know, what a transformation should look like, digital transformation, what the basics should be, what your mindset should be and going to the technical aspects of designing a chatbot or doing contract automation or uh, learning about big data, then about AI, ethical AI and AI is all kind of all pervasive, whether we like it or not, it's going to touch upon every single sector. Uh, there's lots of innovation happening. Um, so it's really open minds to a lot of different stuff. So I really, really uh, was very thankful uh, that I could be part of this uh, first cohort and we had to have the opportunity to learn and to see what's and as Christina mentioned, it's it's really a global ecosystem and then um, it's a matter of time and we are all going to be part of it, whether we like it or not. And uh, the um, you know, you one needs to have that agile mindset to be able to learn it. And as lawyers, um, a lot of us kind of are resistant to learning something new, especially when it comes to tech or any technical stuff. So 
uh, really changing that mindset, especially for young lawyers or even for senior lawyers. It's really important if we have to survive in the um, in the legal industry, as Mark mentioned, uh, people who are going to basically go and learn legal tech because that's the future of law are the ones that are going to survive. Thanks. Thanks, Marsha. And Miklos, over to you for a short kind of intro on what your thoughts are. Yes, hi everyone. So I'm Miklos from Hungary and I'm a lawyer. I'm running my own law office, so this is a small law office. And to be honest, six months ago when I applied for this course, I didn't know much about legal tech, though I had some sense of tech, technology. And I made some researches on artificial intelligence, but related to the medical law. And um, believe me that uh, this uh, journey, uh, this innovation, and uh, this journey of me completely can uh, change your approach to the uh, technology. So, for example, uh, I learned that uh, AI and and the certain uh, technology just is just a piece of uh, of the story, and uh, this course showed me uh, in practice how other tech tools can be used by lawyers. So uh, I've just started up my uh, legal tech consultancy um, company and uh, had the chance to get a partnership with one of a legal engineer. I met during the course. Uh, I use legal chatbot uh, for my clients and also I make legal chatbots uh, for the clients uh, for their in-house legal departments. So we automatize documents with the legal engineer guy. Uh, I use now uh, AI powered uh, document review system and reduce the time for, for this evaluation and due diligence reports uh, radically. So this journey, uh, this kind of innovation, personal in innovation, showed me the practice how, uh, how um, the lectures uh, are working and also gives me a, a, a community, like you said, Christina, a global communi community. So you can meet here uh, guys, everyone from the uh, from the globe and uh, dealing with legal technology, which is completely a different mindset. Perfect. Thanks, Miklos. Um, OK, so um, over to the floor. Any questions from from any of the attendees on you know, the makeup of the course? I mean, there's a lot of information available on the website, there's a bunch, there's a number of FAQs uh, that we gathered based on one of our previous open days, and, and there are a considerable set of questions around how the course is, is is carved up. I mean, we overall we're at just over 20 modules. Um, the pilot is getting the um, exposure across all of them because of, we wanted to iron out any teething issues, etc. But the 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 actual program that cohort two which will kick off in October, will run for about 14 weeks and it'll cover nine core modules and, and five optional. Um, due to some of the, 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 the gap between the end of cohort one, which is end of June and, and cohort two, we've introduced a, a, a slightly compressed version for July, which is like a summer cohort. And that is a bit of online learning, some recorded lectures, but again, um, live workshops and and the hands on exposure. Um, so, uh, you, you know, you don't have to take the entire program. You can take individual modules and build up overall accreditation over a number of cohorts. Um, and we're also now speaking to, you know, some law firms that, you know, may want to curate something bespoke internally. So take a module um, where, for example, if we're delivering a big data, analytics lecture within the LTIC that's four hours or six hours, you know, we may carve that out into two days or three days over a number of weeks for a particular law firm. And again, you know, that would give tick the boxes based on a, 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 law, a law firm's requirements, but also the individuals that, that take part can get credits to pursue the, the LTIC journey on their own if, if, if they want. Um, so, any takers for any questions? No. 
We've got, who have we got? We've got Josh with us from Singapore. Hey, Josh. Hi, Chuck. And hey, everyone, it's late, good to see all of you. It's a bit late. I thought you'd be tucked up in bed. Um, no, it's uh, never too late for me. This city never sleeps. And, uh, you know, Thanks for joining. Thanks just for joining. like you, Chuck, working at all hours. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining. Any anything anything you want to add in terms of your experience so far? Josh is one of our APAC partners and a significant contributor to an APAC kind of faculty. Um, so hopefully, lots to 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 happen in that space. Anything to add, Josh? Yeah, maybe just a quick comment, which is that um, it's actually great to see you know some of the um, first few participants of um, the LTIC here. And it's great to hear all of your experiences. I, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that um, the consistent theme across the board was that there's great actual value that's being brought directly to your work. Um, and I think ALITA, uh, the Asia Pacific Legal Innovation and Technology Association, um, we are very happy to be able to bring an Asia Pacific angle to the curriculum. So I believe in the coming weeks, you will see more of our ALITA faculty um, sharing on some of their courses. So um, I hope um, they will bring added value to all of you. And of course, if there's any comments or thoughts or suggestions on what we can do better, please feel free to let me know or Shark know, and we'll definitely work on it in the next iteration of the LTIC. Thanks, Shark. Cheers, buddy. You can you can head off to bed now, unless you're out. <laughs> out the Thank you. Um, okay, um, Kevin, did we have any anything submitted online or via an email? Shaq, I'm just wondering if you can give us any indication on cost. Yeah, absolutely. So at the moment, um, it's primarily been um, like B2C engagement. So on the B2C kind of engagement, we've um, the, the the face value is three and a half thousand pounds, um, and where um, it's been a tough year for everyone, um, we've obviously catered it for regions. So. You know, if you're from South Africa or Nigeria or, or, or you know, we've priced it accordingly. And we've also enabled uh, where there isn't corporate sponsorship for people to kind of pay um, over a number of months. Um, so now, for example, you know, we have people signed up for October that are spreading their payments over a, a five, six month period. Um, obviously, for a B2B engagement, there's a discussion to be had um you know in terms of but you know so at the moment if someone came to to the website or to us um from a a, a retail perspective it would be three thousand five hundred pounds which is about you know four thousand seven eight hundred dollars um and on a on a law firm if it was a bulk purchase or a, a longer term engagement then you know it's a discussion and you know i'm, I'm obviously pretty realistic in terms of where we are and and, and we want to work with a law firm to kind of one not make this a burden but to to make it a value add and and spread you know spread the implications over a, a longer term yeah that's great thank you no worries no worries um anyone else no okay so um jeremy any closing points Sorry, just coming up oh. um, uh, Yeah, there's just one thing to add as well. One part of the course, which uh, I know, Shat, you're keen to uh, increase over time, is actually getting some real legal tech companies to take part in the cohort and do classes, just giving everyone a chance to experience what practicing lawyers might be using in the workplace or to see what you know get, get examples of what the innovations are so just from our perspective at jameson legal we have a division called uh, jameson legal tech uh, i don't know how we came up with that name but uh, uh it's called jameson legal tech and uh, part of what we do is engage with legal tech companies uh, from around the world actually in in different areas and help them to um uh, meet with new clients and to get into new markets and and one other aspect is helping some of these companies to engage with uh, litic as well uh, and one example of that is a practice management company called uh, uh, app for legal which are going to be running 
uh, some sessions um, on the course. So I think over time, uh, just another added value really will be um, getting a chance to experience all the cutting edge technologies that are out there that will be playing more of a part in the course. Yeah. Cheers, Jeremy. Thanks for that. And and on that, you know, we've had a number of, of tech partners uh, participate. Uh, Microsoft have obviously helped um, a great deal as well in terms of uh, adding some of the hands-on piece. And I and one of the reasons we were quite, we quite heavily involved Microsoft was, you know, one of the messages that we want to get out there is you don't need to spend twenty five, thirty thousand dollars on a collaboration system, on a document management system, you know. 99.9% .9 of you have a Microsoft Enterprise license. You know, there's, you know, e-discovery, there's, you know, SharePoint Online is just as, as well as some of the tech tools out there. There's an immense amount that you can do by just bringing in a legal engineer or a legal consultant for, for 5K that will probably get you off on, on a right journey to save you hundreds of thousands of pounds over a number of years. On, on maintenance and acquisition. And the biggest challenge is implementation of tech, right? We've all been there and fallen over and, and, and said, why the hell did we start this delivery, right? It's never easy, it never will be easy. So, um, you know, we've done some good stuff there. And, and I think, you know, we, we put the, the cohort through a full on document automation journey um, because we want to make sure that, you know, they, they're picking up the right skills over time, that document automation journey where it included Contract Express will include other tech providers. Um, you know, we've got a global view. We're continually, continuously adding uh, tech partners to the program. And we're also signing up with law societies and, and bar associations around the world to add another layer of credibility. You know, we're just signing the dotted line with New South Wales, Australia. Uh, we're talking to the ACC globally. We're talking to the Law Society here. Um, we just engaged with the SRA um, on a research project to look into the the legal and or the compliance um, landscape within law firms. All that will feed into the program, um, and hopefully we can continue to to add value. Um, so, Mark, something for you. Then we head back to the Gov. Wouldn't I? No, no, you said it all. I mean, I noticed this morning Hamdan bin Mohammed has announced a huge uh, innovation fund out of Dubai, and I'm sure Varsha will have more details of that. There's so much opportunity out there. There's so many people looking to get involved. There's some fantastic products coming out of, say, the Middle East. Uh, Jeremy mentioned App for Legal, you know, an absolutely superb uh, app for law firm practice management. But, you know, they need a voice. These people need a voice and others need to know that that exists because otherwise we get into this, we come back to a sort of fairly monopolistic, the firms that have the most money to spend on marketing grow bigger and the firms that have got the best technology, the best able to help lawyers, um, unless they can raise money for marketing, they stay somewhere behind. And I think we all have a duty, all of us on this call and beyond, to constantly highlight amongst ourselves what's going on around the world, what's great, what's good, what can we use to support the law tech infrastructure. And, and I see that as the social role that the that that, that you know this group plays and that what you're doing, Shaq and Christina, Dean Christina, is is doing. So really proud to be a part of it. There's a lot of opportunity out there. There's a lot of money going into it. Let's just do our best to 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 spread the word. Cheers, Mark. Um, before I go to the to the Dean, um, Amir's um, joined as well. Amir, quick 30 seconds on. Amir's helping us um, curate um, some of the online dispute resolution stuff with, with RDO. Um, and so I, I know you didn't expect to speak, so I'll put you on the spot for 30 seconds. We'll test your... Uh... Well, on the basis, and, and Mark will, uh, will attest to this, I do like the sound of my own voice. Uh, I've been told. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, a fantastic discussion. I think Mark's right, um, and depending on what the governor will say, uh, Mark is right insofar as uh, we all have a duty of care uh, to take what we learn uh, w within uh, this organisation and take it out to the world and shout about it. I will certainly be shouting about it uh, on social media momentarily. Thank you. Perfect. OK, excellent. OK, Christina, over to you and then we'll give everyone back a few minutes to enjoy their evening at a time.
Yeah, lovely. I do. I do like the governor. I think um, makes me feel really gangster. But <laughs> um, uh, when I was listening to our wonderful participants, I actually felt quite emotional because, you know, that this was the vision that we set out to try and achieve, which is to really make a difference. Yeah, we have fantastic lecturers and um, partners and uh, sponsors, you know, all, all of that, but, but actually to make a real difference to the people who are part of our, and I'll use the word, our family, I think is, you know, is is really, really important to me. And, and of course, it doesn't, it will not finish at the in, ju in June, because we will, it's a big part of what we do is provide that ongoing ecosystem. But I know great friendships have also been made um, during this uh during this cohort and and i think that you know what distinguishes this from others and what i really like about it is that is the diversity of the 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 participants and and those and everyone else who's involved and if i know one thing it is that we need much greater diversity in our decision making um and in our leadership uh, if we're going to be successful into the future and and this is a fantastic way of really accessing um you know, people who think very differently to you and who might have some incredible insights you know, beyond the faculty beyond all the the experts the the people who are attending who have some fantastic insights and who are your peers and who want to help and work with you so um so yeah that's that's so thank you guys thank you for participating today it means a lot perfect excellent okay um so unless there's any questions we can wrap this up obviously the recording will be available um for those that are interested you know happy to to kick off a discussion obviously kevin's here as well um and we're happy to kind of work with you to to, to build something that's bespoke if the the main cohort doesn't tick the boxes and provide you further details um on that note have a great evening stay safe and thanks to the panel and the attendees especially the cohort we catch up soon thank you very much Bye, bye everybody. Bye. Thanks bye for everyone. coming. Bye. bye. Have a good evening.